Hello, welcome to Board Gems. This is my regular video series in which I cover older board game gems. New gem videos on the 3rd, 13th, and 23rd of every month. But sometimes on those days, I don't do a gem episode. I do something that has been called in the past rough cuts. And the idea is that they're just short little mini reviews of three older games that for whatever reason I decided not to do full episodes on. Uh, I'm not super satisfied with the name Rough Cuts. <laughs> I've gotten some feedback from people who are like, well, I thought it was like an outtakes video or something. So I need a new name. If you can help, that would be great. Leave a comment or send me a message on Board Game Geek or, or something. Preferably alliterative. In this episode, I'm going to cover three games, not all of which are old. One of them is uh, is a little bit newer, but they all have something in common. They're all racing games, and they all have ratings around 6.0 on Board Game Geek, which is not very good. So I thought I'd try them and see how they are so I can tell you how they are, whether they're worthwhile to seek out. Are they hidden gems or are they just hidden? <laughs> and maybe should stay hidden. Let's find out. So the first game is Bridgetown Races. This was designed by Kerry Grayson and was published by Griffin Games in 2010. It's for two to four players. Uh, it takes about 45 to 60 minutes to play. And the box, I think, says 13 and up. And you have to remember that when you see a game box that says 13 up, 14 up, that's not actually useful information in judging how uh, complex or hard to learn the game is, that's just a way of saying that this is very obviously not a toy and so should not have to go through um, expensive uh, testing to make sure that, you know, babies, you know, suck on the pieces and then, you know, get lead poisoning or something. You have a map of, I guess, Portland, which has a lot of bridges on it, and as a racing game, you are having your racer run around all throughout the city taking different forms of transportation, which are mostly differentiated by just moving different amounts. But your goal is to cross bridges using certain transportation methods. Most of the bridges will get a random flag, and the color of the flag determines a type of transportation that you have to use in order to claim that flag. Over the course of five rounds, you're going to be trying to collect as many different flags as possible. Flags from different bridges and different colored flags. The first player to, to cross all eight bridges and collect eight flags can win the game. In a five round game, that's a little bit hard to do. Um, you basically have to just dedicate yourself to doing it from the very beginning, but it's possible. But the main way the game ends is after five rounds, and you look and see who has the most different colored flags. You only collect a flag if you cross a bridge using the same transportation method as the color of the flag. And when you get the flag, it goes onto your own personal board for the space of that bridge. If you later on cross the same bridge again and get a new flag, you can replace the old one, but you want to cross many different bridges because there's one space for every bridge. And there's a bit of planning involved. There's a, a disc, which you put to the side of the board, and the disc shows all the forms of transportation that you can take. And again, they're mostly differentiated by just moving different distances. Each player has four pawns, one of which is the racer that moves around the board, but the other three are used to place on this board to sort of pre-plan not your movement, but the types of transportation you're going to take. After the planning phase, you take turns moving your racer. And every time you move your racer, you pull off one of the pawns from the transportation mode you selected, and then you move your racer that many spaces in any direction you want, although some roads are one way, and there's lots of on-ramps and off-ramps. So the board is actually kind of this fun little little puzzle. Like, it's fun learning the ins and outs, right? It's like, oh, you know, I can easily get from here to there, or there, but I, I gotta be careful because when, when, I, when I come this way, I can't easily turn right. I have to make this big loop, right? So th that's kind of fun. 
And there's a little bit of interaction. Obviously, there's the racing aspect because you're trying to collect flags before other players. A flag on a bridge is first come, first served, and the flags don't get replenished until the start of the next round. So if somebody beats you to a flag, either you do nothing or you change your plan and try to go to a different bridge. You also, though, get bonus movement points for every other player's pawn that's in the same space when you pull yours off. Afterwards, it becomes a timing thing where you have to decide which of your pawns to pull out first because that one is probably going to get bonus movement. If you wait on a pawn, other players are going to pull their pawns off first, and so there's not going to be any pawns on the space left maybe when your turn comes around again and you're not getting that bonus movement. There are also three inner spaces, and again, these are first come, first served. By putting a pawn there in the middle, you're sacrificing your, your movement but these give you a special ability. So there's one that doubles one of your movements. There's one that allows you to swap two flags. That's huge. The other one just allows you to take the first turn in the round. So some interesting ideas there. And it's a really fun puzzle to at the beginning of the round to try to figure out how you're going to make this work, right? You have your little, in the first round, Basically, you're just going as far as you can trying to get whatever flags and ideally not going where other people are because if they beat you to a flag, you're going to have to go somewhere else. And then starting with the second round, it becomes quite challenging because you don't know what bridges are going to get what flags. And you want to cross every bridge. That gets you the most flags. But what wins you the game, usually, is having the most different flags. So later in the game, having a bridge have a flag and you haven't crossed that bridge yet and you don't have that color flag, that's huge. You have to get that. Last round comes, there are only a couple of bridges that you don't have flags for. What colored flag comes out onto those bridges is massive. If it's a color you don't have and you feel like you can get to that bridge relatively quickly in the round, that's huge for you. But if you're far away from that bridge, or if it's a different color than you need, not really useful. So what becomes extremely important in that last round is player order because of one particular space, the swap space. The first player to go in that last round, which is the player who has, I think, the fewest flags, or the, 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 what the game has determined is the last place player, they will be going first in that final round and they get to put their piece on the swap space, which allows them to change, swap two flags, such that now they have a flag of a color they don't have on a bridge that they can get to that they haven't crossed yet. If you're not getting that swap, you might be totally boned that last round. Alternate way of winning the game, which is to get eight flags for eight bridges, regardless of their colors, is hard to do in a five round game. And so they said, so the designer suggests you can try playing six rounds. That sixth round though would be even more brutal than that fifth and what was final round. You add a sixth round when there's just maybe just one or two flags that you need and you better hope that color flag is what you need or you're going first so you can use the swap space. It was a really fun puzzle up until that last round. It's a puzzle that your brain is constantly trying to solve, but in that last round, you may not be able to solve it. It may not be even possible to solve it because you just can't do what you would need to win. And so that fifth and final round, if one player has a lead going in, it can be impossible to catch up to them. They're, they're, it doesn't build to a climax, which is an unfortunate thing. And it's really almost the only sort of downside to it. Um, it's actually a really fun puzzle. The board is quite small, but it's only a two to four player game. Um, I find it works relatively well with all player numbers, with three probably being the sweet spot. I should know my family is three. So if a, a game plays well with three, I'm going to know it. As racing games go, you know, sometimes racing games don't have a lot of player interaction. And this one 
doesn't have much player interaction in the actual racing part of it, but there's a nice little bit of interaction in the in the wheel and choosing where to go and wh- what uh, which ones are going to get bonuses, which transportation methods. I really enjoyed my plays of it. It's a really nice puzzly game that just kind of lets me down at the end, um, just being a bit anticlimactic. Uh, you want you want a game to build. You want a game to have an arc. And in this game, each round is kind of similar. There is a natural arc in which the first round you can go pretty much anywhere, but then starting with the second round, you're more directed and like, I have to go here, like this is what I need to do. But the arc just tapers off at the end because that last round is sometimes a fait accompli, but maybe not. (laughs) You don't know until that round starts and the random flags get added and it's like, well, Joe won. (laughs) I don't think we can... We we're able to work it out unless somebody can do the swap. Then maybe they have a chance. But anybody else who's playing is probably not in contention. So that's really the only downside. Uh, it's a neat little game. It's definitely worth at least a few plays. Uh, but it wouldn't be one that I would necessarily recommend for for a permanent collection. Uh, it's if the end game was a little bit more climactic and had a bit more variability in terms of going into the last round. You know that you might be able to pull off the win, but you know, you're know you not sure how, you need to figure it out. That would be really exciting, and Bridgetown Races doesn't have that. But before that last round, the play is really interesting and fun, and I like it. If you come across it, give it a try. If you like racing games, if you like kind of puzzly type games, give it a try. It is fun, for sure. Again, it just lets me down in that last round. But I'll put it this way, if you never get a chance to try it, don't feel too, too bad. It's a good game. There are lots of good games. And you can't possibly play and own them all. So don't feel too bad if you miss out on Bridgetown Races. But it's it's clever. Chariot Race was designed by Matt Leacock, who's most famous for Pandemic. And was published originally by Pegasus. This English edition is from uh, Eagle Griffin Games. It's for two to six players... Although two and three players, you're going to want to use multiple chariots per per player. So you probably want to go at least four players if possible. But it, but it works with fewer. It's just you got to be okay with controlling multiple racers. For what it's worth, before I get too much into it, it is actually fairly easy to control multiple racers in this game. It isn't a super complex thing. The game takes about 30 to 40 minutes to play. I think that's pretty fair. And I think the box says ages eight and up. Uh, yeah, probably pretty fair. My favorite board game of all time, as some of you may know, is Ave Caesar, or Ave Kaiser. I'm very curious about the chariot racing theme. I love Ave Caesar so much, I want to try lots of games of that type. So I have Chariots of Rome, which I have unfortunately have not been able to get played. It's, it's a tough sell. I do have an old copy of Circus Maximus, which I also have not played. I'm very curious about. And there's a new GMT game uh, called Charioteer. So chariot racing is a pretty common theme in board games. So what's the thing about this one? Ave Caesar is really simple. This one is only a little bit more going on. And actually, that's going to be attractive to a lot of gamers. Um, That is, some people, and they're wrong, but some people think of Ave Caesar as a kid's game because it's so simple. And sometimes people just want a little bit more going on, right? And so that could be Chariot Race. It's an interesting blend of a simple racing game with just a little bit extra added um, to satisfy hobbyists. So you have a simple oval, the circuit, the circus. And it's a two halves of a board and they're double-sided. So you can actually switch between the two. So there's like an A side and a B side. So there's technically four different tracks that you can have, although the tracks are basically identical except for the presence of rocks. So each chariot has a, well, it has a little cardboard standee. And you know what? Okay, Ave Caesar's got little plastic chariots, which is great. And this game was at a super low price point when it came out. It's not reasonable to expect that to have plastic chariots. Even still, like these chariots, they're cardboard with cardboard inserts. 
Um, if you glue them, they're fine. I always worry when I pick them up, the cardboard pieces are going to come out. I'd rather have plastic, plastic little t tabs you can put the cardboard in, right? Plastic standees. That would be that would be better, but you know it it works. And each player also has this little sheet um, with pegs on the top left and right. The top one shows their luck, and you can spend luck to repair your chariot. I'm not sure how that works. Oh, it wasn't as bad as you thought it was. You got lucky. Uh, but also to change some of the dice results. And on the left is the strength, the, the health of your chariot, and on the right is your speed. And your speed can't exceed the position of the tag for your chariot's health. So the lower your chariot's health goes down, the lower the maximum speed of your chariot. On the right side shows your speed as a as a number, but that also tells you how many dice you roll. And the more dice you roll, the better, because you have more control. The dice have various symbols on them, so you cannot change lanes unless you get a change lane result on your dice. Uh, there's attack, and some of the dice results adjust your speed. One of them allows you to adjust your speed up or down. Another result increases your speed twice but gives you a damage. And what happens is at the start of your turn you roll dice, you choose some to keep, you re-roll the rest, and whatever is on your dice you have to do that thing. I mean I guess you don't have to change lanes or attack, but you want to attack. But what I mean is like those speed adjustments, you can't decide not to take those speed adjustments. That you don't have full control of your chariot, right? Your chariot's going to speed up, and you sometimes don't have control over that. And you go too fast into the corners. Now, there's three lanes, and the corners have basically speed limits. And for every speed higher than the speed limit that you're going through the corner in, you take damage. It doesn't affect the movement of your chariot, which it feels a little weird. You just take damage. When I first look at the board and I look at that speed limit, at the beginning of the game, I'm thinking, I gotta, you know, stay within that speed limit, right? I don't want to hurt my chariot. But the race is only two laps, which is extremely short. You can basically just blast through those corners. You'll take damage, and that's fine. You're gonna get a lead and it can be hard for other players to catch up. Of course, they have to push their chariot harder, but when you're low on health, it is very easy to be taken out of the game. If you get rammed, whether you are the rammer or the rammy, you will take two damage. So if you're not winning the race, but you have a lot of health, and the player who's in the lead doesn't have much health, you can ram them from behind and potentially take them out of the game. It can be frustrating if you're not in the lead and that happens to you because players don't have full control. If they don't get the change lane rolls that they need, they might end up in the same lane as you with way too much speed and they'll crash into the back of you. You are second place, you're threatening first place, but through no fault of your own, the guy behind you just was a bull-eyed and just smashed up into your into your rear and took you out. Maybe took them out too. <laughs> so that could be a little bit frustrating. You kind of have to go with the flow though. You want a chariot racing game to be... You want there to be victims, right? There's actually quite a lot of game in this little box because all the racers are the same on one side of the sheet, but you flip over the other side of the sheet and each charioteer has its own stats. Uh, maybe some have more health, some some have less. You gotta be more careful. So it just adds again to the variety of the game. And the fact that you can switch the track up adds a bit of variety too. The B sides of each end of the track have rocks, which makes changing lanes much, much more important. I don't recommend playing BB. <laughs> Uh, it, it, people are going to be taken out of the game. And you know what? It's a short game. You really have to approach this from the point of view of you do have some control, but whether you win or not is not going to be entirely up to you. It depends on whether you get attacked, whether you're able to avoid those rocks, whether you ram or are rammed. Actually, Cherry Race is 
for me, in a really interesting position because everything about it on paper seems perfect. Like, I love that it's a short game. I love that there are decisions to make with your resources, right? Um, but it's otherwise still a very simple game. Lots of chaos, potentially lots of laughs. You have a really simple game, right? And chaos happens as a result. You always get some people who are like, oh, you know, I lost due to the roll of the dice. It's not my fault. And they may say they hate the game as a result. But sometimes you have like a super deep strategy game. It doesn't fit a racing game, right? You, you don't want a long two-hour game. You don't want a ton of management. It's supposed to be a racing game. You're supposed to be going fast, right? Striking that balance between making it play fast and not take forever versus still having interesting things to do on your turn is a, a balance that you want to try to achieve. And on paper, Chariot Race does achieve that. I think the problem that people may have with it is that the results, the chaotic results, don't feel like they match up with the, albeit relatively small, amount of planning that you do in the game. So if you're playing just a super big luck fest, and in the end you crash two-thirds of the way through, and you're out of the race, you can have a laugh. And Or if you're the type of gamer, you may complain about the luck of the dice or whatever, right? But that's kind of the nature. You had no control or very little control, and the result felt like it matched that. And once you start adding more decisions, more planning, there's an expectation that the result of that planning should be comparable. Do you know what I mean? Like the person who planned better should do better. If you're planning well, you're making these decisions, then you have some control over whether you win or lose by a small amount or get smashed. The planning part is not really all that complicated, but it's enough. There's enough decisions added to it that makes you want to think or feel as though you have some control over the outcome. And in the end, you don't really. <laughs> you really don't have much control. And you certainly don't have control of the other players who might ram into you when you're in second trying to eke out that win. And somebody rams you from behind and takes you both out. You know what? You might be frustrated by that. If you had very little control of the game up to that point, like you made very few decisions, you could probably just laugh it off and say, well, that's what happened, right? But when you're planning and moving your things around, and like, okay, I'm going to spend my fortune to, to change this die into this result and then, you know, do whatever. And then in the end, you get taken out by a ram. <laughs> I think that's where the disconnect can happen. So... I think that's a problem a lot of people would have with it, is that disconnect. My only real problem with it is the arc, because the game is so short. And I understand if players can be taken out of the game, that's fair, right? You don't want the game, you don't want an hour-long game if somebody's out in the first 20 minutes. But it's too short. And you don't get that feeling of managing the health of your chariot versus your speed, you know, that feels like it fits a longer game. I think playing more laps would be beneficial to the game. Um, just so there's a little bit more management in a little bit of jockeying of position because you you don't want to blow through those corners too early, um, too fast, right? Because you still have a long race to go, so you need to manage things a little bit better. Um, not having played it that way, I feel like the arc would be a little bit better with uh, for that. But um, this game is worth experimenting with. It's a really solid base of a game that, again, can create a little bit of a disconnect, perhaps, between different um, players' expectations. Um, but it's an easy game, I think, to find. It's not very, like, well sought after. The ratings are kind of low. It was originally very cheap, but I don't think it's really gone up in value since then. So if you come across it and you like racing games, you owe it yourself to give it a try and give it a couple of plays, 
right? Try, I wouldn't try BB, the floor, the, the side of the boards that are B and B, you know, try AA first and, but don't just play it the one time, right? Play it a couple times, try the, the, the rocks to make it a more challenging uh, game and more, more chaos if people kind of smash into them. And give the other side of the racers a try with the variable um, stats. Um, there's a lot of game packed into this tiny little box, and it's worth checking out. The last game I'm going to talk about is Velo City. Velocity. It was designed by Kevin Nunn and published by Abacus in 2010. It's for three to seven players. Seven players! Ages eight and up, takes 30 to 45 minutes to play, all pretty reasonable. Seven players! Aren't that many games that play up to seven. So I'm interested in this game. But the ratings are really, really low on Board Game Geek. It's like a 5.7, 5.8, something like that. Seven players, though, so I have to try this out for myself. So the idea of the game is that each player has a number of cyclists, and there's a track, kind of an S-shaped track, and you're trying to get all of your cyclists across the finish line first. It is essentially a roll-and-move game. Roll-and-moves, people make fun of them, but it is a thing that everybody can kind of understand. You know, if players have only played stuff like Monopoly and Clue and, and other roll-and-move games, and they play something like Velo City, you introduce them to a game like this, they're going to like, I think, this roll-and-move aspect, because there's a few different parts of the roll and move, right? For one thing, you have multiple cyclists. So on your turn, you can choose which of your cyclists to move with your roll. There's a little bit of management of the results based on how many energy cans you have. So players have these little blue uh, cylinders, which are, I guess, they're supposed to be like uh, energy drinks, right? There are spaces on uh, the board, which are manholes, that if you land on, you have to go back, but you can spend an energy drink to not have to go back. You can spend energy drinks to draft other players, and you can you can spend cans to improve your roll before you roll. So if you think this is like an important roll coming up and you want more options, for example, you can spend your energy cans to improve the the possibilities on your dice not much in the way of mitigating after you roll them though once you roll them you're stuck with that you can roll the dice first and then decide which cyclist to move at which point you just have your own die to deal with or before you roll you pick one of your cyclists and you say i am going to move this cyclist for sure and you roll a die for yourself, but also every other player's die who is in the same space as you. And so that gives you more options because you can choose another player's die and then that will help them. I'm sorry my memory's failing me a little bit. It's been a while since I've played this game. And now that I'm talking about it, my memory's kind of failing me a little bit. I should have like played a solo game by myself or something just before doing this video just to make sure that I, I remembered everything. I think the other player gets a, gets a draft for free or, or something. So, but it gives you more choices, right? With the effect that you're potentially helping somebody else. But you can choose which players who are in the same space as you, which dice to roll. So, for example, if one player is doing really well, one player is doing really poorly, you're sharing a space with both of them, you can choose to also roll the die of the player who's doing doing poorly because you don't mind as much if you help them out. So you can do things like that. When a player moves a cyclist, if you have a cyclist in that same space, you can spend an energy can to go along with them. Very, very useful if they're moving quite far. There's some funny parts of the game, like just before the start, there's a manhole. It's it happens. It's happened to, in games I've played, 
where a player ke- at the start keeps rolling the manhole, like keeps rolling, moves onto the manhole. They have to move back. They move have to move back to the start space. Now, when you move back to the start space, you get energy cans as compensation. So, you know, if you if it keeps happening to eventually you can spend an energy can to not have to move back, right? <laughs> But it's funny when it keeps happening to the same person. Actually, I don't have much complaint about the game for most of the time it plays. It's a really breezy game, really simple. Um, Turns can sometimes feel a little bit obvious. Um, But, you know, you you want a breezy game if you're playing with seven people. And seven people is probably the only way I'd play it, only because if you have fewer, you have so many choices, right? But the fact that you can play this with seven means, oh, we have seven players, what do we want to play? You just want to play something quick, right? You know, you could play a party game or, or something, but if you want to play, like, like a light family strategy game, this is potentially a good fit for seven players. Even though it's really simple and it's kind of really obvious for four-fifths of the game, it really breaks down at the end. And my understanding... Now, I heard this secondhand, so remember... Everything I say may be either apocryphal or wildly inaccurate, one of the two. But my understanding is that the winning conditions were changed by the publisher, different from what they were previously um, in the original design. Um, I can't confirm or deny that. I can confirm that as written, the rules in the box, the end game is entirely broken. (laughs) It it does not work. After the finish line, there's eight spaces. And with the rules as written, the game ends when all eight spaces are filled. So the first cyclist to cross the finish line goes to the far end, and then all the cyclists come in after that. And as soon as eight have passed the finish line, game is over. Then the player who has the most cyclists who cross the finish line wins. Seems reasonable. Well, when you play with many players, like six or seven players, ties are extremely common. It's very, very common for multiple. So the most one player has is two across the finish line, and multiple players have two. And so then it goes to a tiebreaker. And what's the tiebreaker? The player whose cyclist crossed the finish line last. Once you near the end, and maybe like six cycles across a finish line, maybe just two left or whatever, sometimes those last players, they don't want to cross the finish line. They want to cross the finish line after their rival. So then they'll win the tiebreaker. And so then the racing part breaks down. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work. And it's, it's a real shame. I think it works fine for when you're playing with fewer players, but the advantage of this game is you can play with a lot. Um, So there is a thread on BoardGameGeek from a friend of the designer who suggests that um, you may want to try it with this variant. Play until one player crosses uh, all their cyclists across the finish line and then finish the round so other players have a chance to, to potentially tie. I forgot what the tiebreaker is, but it makes a lot more sense than the rules as printed in the game. This is a game that if you never play it, you'll be fine. Like, you won't you won't miss it. Like, there isn't a Velo City-sized hole in your collection that needs filling. Having said that, it is good to have a simple, breezy game that can play seven people. Um, hard to say who this game is for, though. I mean, it's really for people who are fans of Roll and Move. Like, it's a great Roll and Move. It's a Roll and Move. So... Uh, I don't think hobbyists are really going to care much for this. I do know that people have enjoyed it in the restaurant when I had it in there. So, you know, at least it's gotten plays. I actually, I don't know how well they liked it. (laughs) Maybe they hated it for all I know. But I have seen it played multiple times because, again, it plays seven people, right? And it's a relatively easy game to learn, right? So it's a type of game that at a board game cafe or restaurant, right, you can take it, you can read the rules, pretty straightforward you can play it doesn't take that long plays to seven people it's a nice breezy experience don't go out of your way to you know go nuts to try to find a copy of this um it's a once in a while game i enjoy my games when i play it but if i didn't play it again i'd probably be okay the design 
as a roll and move is is good. I, I actually like it when some, when you have newer games, and this is 2010, mind you, but when they have newer games that basically are improvements, refinements on old ideas, right? So you have a, a, a roll and move games that would have been popular in the 80s, and you have something like this that came out in 2010, which is an improvement and refinement over that type of game. So again, people who enjoy roll and moves, like maybe non-gamers who've only played board games when they were kids, but now they're much, much older, um, I don't think they'll hate the game. I think it's not a bad experience. Um, but again, if you're a hobbyist, you're looking for a recommendation. I always tell people this video series not recommendations, okay? Don't go out and buy a game just because I talked about it, please. <laughs> it's a fun game. It's not one you have to worry about too much. But I will say at least that if you see it for cheap and you like racing games, you like you want a game that plays up to seven people and you roll and move doesn't bother you, especially if there's ways to mitigate it with, you know, drinking energy drinks and stuff like that, then if you come across it, Try it out, but just make sure you play with the designer's rules, not the rules in the box. Well, that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks for watching. Remember, older games like these don't stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.